Hello friends and welcome to the first video in rapid revision of orthopedics by Dr. Pratik Joshi and that is general terminology and concepts in orthopedics. Now before I start, if any one of you has not yet subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and subscribe so that as and when I put up some new content, it is delivered directly to you. Now some slides in this powerpoint may be a little too theoretical which means there could be a lot of text written in the slide but um, while i have made these powerpoints i have designed those slides such that the slides with a lot of text are the ones which actually have most of the keywords or the catchphrases which you need to write in your theory answer or which you need to uh, talk about in your viva voce examination so as and when these slides come up please go ahead and pause the video and write down what is there in the slide or you can screenshot it. The entire PowerPoint has been made by me from scratch so it is entirely open source and go ahead to share it to as many of your friends as you like. So without any further ado, let us start off on the first theoretical terminology that is the name of the subject itself. Now orthopedics in itself comes from a, an old Greek terminology which is orthos plus pedia. Orthos referring to the art of correction or of making straight and pedics referring to children. So in the truest sense orthopedics was actually a branch referred to straightening out of children which means it was a reference to the kind of treatments which were given when orthopedics was only involved in correction of gross skeletal deformities in pediatric patients. Of course orthopedics has gone a long way since then and therefore here comes our next set of terminologies that is stress, strain and stress riser. Now the formula for stress in orthopedics is the same as the formula for stress or pressure in physics that is force applied per unit area. So a force over a given material divided by the area over it is which it is acting is called as stress. Now when you apply a stress to a particular body the body will deform and the most common way in which the body will deform is by increase or a decrease in its length so there will be a change in its length now if you were to plot the change of length of the given body divided by the original length or if you were to obtain a differential for the change of the length of the body what you get is the strain so it is the change in the length of a given body divided by the original length now that we are familiar with stress and strain let us make a simple graph and let us plot stress versus strain on this graph now when you plot stress on the y-axis and strain on the left uh, on the x-axis what you get is a graph which is something like this to a certain extent stress and strain are proportional to each other and beyond a certain point the entire graph becomes a plateau now this point where the graph stops becoming linear and becomes a plateau is called as the proportional limit. Within some part of the proportional limit is also a point called as the yield point. We will talk about this later. Now if you were to plot the slope of the graph as divided by stress versus strain or stress divided by strain as a slope, what you get is the Young's modulus. Now let us look at a formal graph. The Young's modulus is this line which is the slope of the stress strain curve. Now as we know not everybody is a perfect cylinder or a perfect square or a perfect cube. A lot of them have anatomical abnormalities or they are just created in such a fashion that they are geometrically asymmetric and therefore when you apply a stress through a particular body it may not be distributed equally throughout the body and therefore there are some places in the body which will have a larger amount of stress and there are some places in the body which will have a smaller amount of stress. Now the places where a large amount of stress is brought together or a large amount of stress is concentrated in a particular point in the geometry of the body is called as a stress riser or a stress concentrator and this is secondary to the geometric properties of the object it is also known as a stress concentrator and the importance of this is that if you apply too much of strain or too much of stress to a particular body then it is going to break or it is going to fail at the point of stress riser or at the stress concentrator. Now when you apply a particular force to a body one thing is its length can change the second is you can bring about a deformation which is the change in the shape of the body. So if you apply a force to a particular body and the body 
changes its shape or it deforms and the body reforms or regains its original shape after the entire force has been removed then this is called as elasticity now if you were to apply the same force and the body got deformed but it did not reform into its original shape after the force was removed then it is called as plasticity now i'd like to draw your attention to one particular phrase which is there in both these definitions and that is without fracture which means an elastic body should be able to deform and reform without breaking a plastic body should be able to deform and keep that shape with itself without breaking now speaking of breaking the ability of a body to withstand a suddenly applied force to it is called as strength or toughness now the key word here is a sudden application of force so the stronger the body is the more is its ability to withstand a suddenly applied force to it and a body which cannot withstand such a force will of course immediately break before elasticity or plasticity will kick in and therefore the body is said to be brittle so the absence of elasticity or plasticity or the propensity of a body to break immediately after the sudden application of a force is called as brittleness now moving on a breach in the continuity of a bone is called as a fracture now the fracture can either be an open fracture or a closed fracture depending on whether the fracture hematoma which results as a consequence of the fracture is communicating with the outside atmosphere or not this is probably the first and the most important definition in clinical orthopedics and that is an open fracture is a fracture in which the fracture hematoma communicates with the outside atmosphere through a traumatic wound which is in the overlying skin and soft tissue caused by the fracture now please remember that in such a case the wound may not directly overlie the fracture site in most cases it does but this is not an eliminatory factor and what we need to see is if the fracture hematoma is in direct communication with the atmosphere through that wound if it is it is a compound fracture if it is not it is a closed fracture now another terminology which often gets confused with a compound fracture is a comminuted fracture and comminuted fracture is a fracture where the bone is broken into more than two or three or more pieces that is called as a comminuted fracture moving on there are three types of fractures which happen in the absence of a very large amount of force they are stress fractures insufficiency fractures and pathologic fractures now stress fracture is a fracture which happens to a bone when it is stressed which means that a large amount of load which is sub maximal which means the amount of load which is applied to the bone is less than what the bone can bear at maximal capacity but what breaks the bone is not the sub maximal amount of force which is being applied but the cyclical loading which means the sub maximal force applied in a large frequency or at a high frequency is what causes a stress fracture now an insufficiency fracture is a non traumatic or a fracture which occurs with little to no trauma in a bone which is anatomically normal but which is physiologically weak which means an osteopenic bone osteopenic bone whose weakness is because of osteomalacia or osteoporosis or any generalized metabolic process which causes the bone to be weak third is a pathologic fracture which is a spontaneous fracture in a non traumatic setting this fracture also occurs in a non traumatic setting but in an anatomically abnormal bone which means there is a focal pathology such as paget's disease or metastasis due to a malignancy now the a simple way to remember this is we have stress fracture we have insufficiency fracture and we have pathologic fracture now this here a for anatomy p for physiology so a stress fracture is anatomically normal physiologically normal an insufficiency fracture is anatomically normal but physiologically abnormal and a pathologic fracture is 
anatomically abnormal as well as physiologically abnormal. It is the interplay between the anatomy of the bone and the physiology of the bone which will decide which of these three fractures will happen in a non-traumatic or a less traumatic setting. Now, moving on to trauma related terminology. The first terminology you will require to know as an undergraduate student is the definition of polytrauma. The definition of polytrauma was given as recently as NCBI 2017 giving the Berlin definition. So as per the abbreviated injury scale, it should be more than three, which means a severe injury to two or more body regions plus one of the following, which is hypotension, unconsciousness, acidosis, coagulopathy and an elderly patient or a patient whose age is more than 70 years. Please write down this definition because this is a definition which is useful in the clinical setting as well as in an examination setting. Moving on, we have a concept of a primary injury and a secondary injury. Now, when a person or a body suffers an impact, the damage taken by the body as a result of the physical impact itself is called as a primary injury. Now, as a result of the primary injury, the tissue will incite an intense local inflammatory response. It is mediated by arachidonic acid metabolites. It is in, uh, mediated by interleukins, cytokines and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And because of that, there are changes of edema, inflammation, vasodilation and all the changes of a local inflammatory response. Now, in some cases, these changes can cause further injury by neurovascular compression, by increase in compartment pressure leading to compartment syndrome and they can further worsen the primary injury and this is called as a secondary injury. So the injury caused to the tissue as a result of the physiological response to primary injury. The key word here is physiological response to primary injury and that is called as a secondary injury. Now moving on, we have to differentiate between a high energy trauma and a low energy trauma. Now high energy and low energy trauma will decide how much soft tissue injury you can expect as a clinician, how much uh, you can expect the other systems to be involved or how frequent are vascular injuries, compound fractures and multi-systemic involvement. So any patient who is suffering from a high velocity road traffic accident, a fall from more than standing height or an, uh, accidents happening in an industrial or mechanized setting. these are patients who have suffered a high energy trauma. We should have a high index of suspicion for soft tissue injury, multi-system involvement, also involvement of spine, involvement of pelvis and also involvement of internal hemorrhages should be expected in patients such as these. Low energy trauma is trauma where the amount of energy imparted to a bone is less as compared to the high energy trauma. So you will see these in patients who have had self falls from their vehicles or those who have fallen from less than standing height or trauma in a domestic setting such as an elderly person falling in a bathroom or an elderly person twisting their leg at home. These are falls in a domestic setting and therefore the chances of compound fractures or vascular injury are less in these people. However, a point to note here is that these fractures or fractures resulting from low energy trauma are mainly seen in elderly and osteoporotic age group and therefore a good index of suspicion for occult fractures should also be present. Now in terms of fixation of fractures, the first and foremost is reduction of a fracture. Now when a patient of a fracture presents to you, the patient will have a fracture where the anatomical alignment of the fracture fragments is displaced. The fracture fragments which were supposed to be anatomically aligned are now not aligned and therefore the first job of an orthopedic surgeon is to bring back the anatomical alignment or to restore the anatomical alignment and this is called as reduction. So the restoration of the bone to the normal anatomical alignment is called as reduction. Now depending on whether you need to incise the skin and the soft tissue and open the fracture hematoma or not the reduction can be open reduction or closed reduction respectively. Now once the reduction has been achieved, it is essential to splint the limb and it is essential to prevent the re-dislocation or the 
re-displacement of the fracture and therefore the fracture must be immobilized or fixed and the next term we know is fixation that is the process of applying some kind of an apparatus which will prevent the displacement of fracture fragments once reduction has been achieved and now this apparatus which we apply can be an external fixator apparatus a part of which lies outside the body or it can be an internal fixator apparatus which lies entirely within the body and by that we can describe either external fixation or internal fixation respectively. Moving on to the last point in this lecture that is virus and valgus and virus and valgus is a feature of joint alignment and later on in terms of fracture fixation it can be a feature of fracture alignment. A simple way to remember things is that any joint which has moved towards the midline if this is the midline and this is your joint now a normal alignment would be something like this if we are looking at a bilateral knee joint normal alignment would be something like this where both the knee joints are equidistant and at a distance from the midline now if you can see this knee joint has moved towards the midline this knee joint has moved towards the midline which means both the knee joints have been medialized or they have gone towards the center of the anatomical axis of the body this is called as valgus v a l g u s this is called as valgus the opposite is called varus which means if this here was the normal alignment externalization or lateralization of the joint away from the midline of the body is called as varus so this is this is a joint in varus and here we have a joint in valgus. I hope the terminology is clear and get in touch with me. My contact email is in the channel information. You can hit me up on Facebook or Instagram and you can leave comments here for feedback or criticism or anything else that you'd like to say. And before I sign off, please like, share and subscribe and share this video through your friends and subscribe to the channel so that you can get all my new content. Thank you for listening and this is Dr. Pratik Joshi signing out. Have a nice day.